In an earlier video, we saw the superdense coding protocol. Let me remind you of how the final stages of that protocol worked. They involved the actions of someone named Bob, uh, who has in his laboratory uh, two qubits. And those two qubits are in one of four possible quantum states. So I'll write out the, the quantum states now. I'm going to uh, write them out uh, without the ket notation and also without normalization factors. So the first is 0, 0, plus 1, 1, really all over root 2, but I'll leave that out. The second state is 1, naught plus naught 1. The third state is naught naught minus 1, 1, different from the first state. And the fourth state is 1, naught minus naught 1, again, different from uh, the second state because of that minus sign. OK, so we've got one of these four quantum states. They're two qubit uh, states, as you see. Uh, and uh, in particular, what Bob uh, does with these two qubits, first of all, is a uh, controlled NOT gate, and then a Hadamard on the first, followed by a measurement. And the goal of these operations, as you'll recall, is to tell the distinguish the four states from one another. So at the end of the day, Bob will get two bits of outcome uh, from these two uh, measurements. And using those two bits, he was able to determine which of these four states he had at the start. He distinguishes one of those uh, four states as the actual state uh, that he has. And from that, he's able to infer the uh, information that Alice was trying to, uh, to send uh, to him. Just a little piece of useful nomenclature. Uh, these four states are often called the Bell states. So we called the first of them the Bell state uh, earlier, uh, but, and taken together, they're often called the Bell states, uh, or sometimes uh, the Bell basis, uh, for reasons that will become apparent uh, a little bit later on. Um, so there's a lot of detail uh, in the circuit that we showed uh, originally, uh, but in fact, it's possible for an expert to look quickly at the four Bell states, uh, and just see that there's a way of distinguishing them without having to go into all the detail uh, of the quantum circuit. And in this sort of expert point of view, the quantum circuit is merely a detail uh, to be filled in uh, at leisure and not something that you really have to worry a lot about. So it's a sort of a simpler point of view, this uh, expert point of view. And the reason an expert can do it is because of a particular result. And what the result says is that orthonormal quantum states, let me write it, write it out, uh, the result says that if you have orthonormal quantum states, any set of them, like, well, as we'll see, the Bell states, so if you have an orthonormal set of quantum states, you can, they can always be distinguished from one another. They can always be told apart, in other words. And this is essentially the result that an expert is, is using when they think about the superdense coding protocol. So we'll prove this uh, shortly, and I'll explain in a little bit more detail exactly uh, what I mean. But first, I want to uh, check that the Bell states are orthonormal uh, to one another. Now, of course, they're, you know, they're valid quantum states, and therefore they're normalized. So really, all this means uh, is checking that they're orthogonal uh, to one another. So let's uh, check uh, the orthogonality of just two of them to one another. So let's say uh, the first state and the fourth, uh, sorry, the third state, I think it was, uh, are these two states. And it's perhaps easiest uh, to do uh, in the column vector form. So we get a one here, a zero, zero for the other two computational basis states, and then a one for the final computational basis state. And this, is a very similar sort of a vector, but we get a minus one over root two uh, as the final amplitude. And you can easily see, you can easily check um, that these two states are indeed orthogonal to one another. Uh, when you take their inner product, you know, this term times this term gives you one half, while this final term uh, gives you minus one half, and therefore uh, they cancel uh, one another out, uh, the inner product uh, vanishes. So these are indeed orthogonal quantum states, and you can go through and in fact check that all four of the Bell states are mutually orthogonal uh, to one another. So this result is telling you that it is in 
you know, indeed possible uh, to distinguish the Bell states uh, in some way. And uh, that's why the uh, quantum computing expert uh, knows that it's possible to do that in the superdense coding protocol, even without seeing uh, the details of the circuit. So let's actually uh, prove the result. Uh, just uh, you know, for your convenience, I'll rewrite uh, the result up on the screen um, so that you remember what we're proving. Orthonormal quantum states uh, can be distinguished from one another and let's prove it. It stands for proof. Um, so in particular, let's suppose that we've been given a set of states orthogonal to one another, psi 0, psi 1, all the way down through say psi m minus 1. These are just labels. Um, and these are the orthonormal quantum states uh, that we want to distinguish from one another. So we've got m total states. Uh, and these are, as I say, they're just labels. So we're going to have to you know, come up with some procedure uh, for doing the distinguishing. And what we're going to do is we're going to define a unitary matrix that acts on this, takes them to computational basis states, um, and then we're able to distinguish the computational basis states uh, using a, a measurement in the computational basis, and thus actually distinguish these quantum states. So the first step of that is to define the appropriate unitary operation. And to do that, actually we need to introduce some extra structure into the space so we know how the unitary acts on the whole space, not just on these um, orthonormal quantum states, but elsewhere. So in particular, um, we'll actually extend this basis, this so we're going to introduce extra orthonormal, which I won't write out, uh, in full states. And let's call them psi m, psi m plus 1, all the way down through psi 2 to the n minus 1. So I'm assuming that we're in an n qubit uh, space, uh, whatever the appropriate uh, dimension uh, is here. And we can introduce these using you know, the Gram-Schmidt process or whatever, I I any suitable process for finding an orthonormal uh, basis. And the details of what these states are actually don't matter at all. Um, and so the matrix we're going to define, which I claim is unitary, um, is just this one. So these are just the row vectors corresponding to the psi j states that we have. And these states, the j's, are the uh, 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 different computational basis states. So uh, in particular, um, you know, we're summing over j from 0 to 2 to the n minus 1. So you can just regard this, if you like, as the number you know, uh, corresponding to a particular uh, computational basis state uh, when we write out its, its binary expansion. Um, so you know, I claim uh, that you, well, for, there are two, two things we, we want to see. Uh, first of all, I just want you to observe that if we let u act on a particular state psi j, it just gives us j back. And that's, that's actually pretty easy uh, to check and follows from the uh, orthogonality of the different psi j's. Um, so I won't go through the details of that, but you, you should be able to see that pretty easily at this stage. The other thing we need to check is that u is indeed a unitary operation. And that follows uh, along very similar lines to the, the, the proof we had in an earlier video um, that a similar construction for you uh, was, was unitary. So I won't go through it uh, here. It's a good exercise, however, uh, for you uh, uh, to go through. So u is indeed unitary. And so we see what happens. Uh, you know, we, we have our starting state. It's one of these different, you know, psi 0, psi 1, or whatever. So let's imagine we start with psi j. We apply u that takes us to the computational basis state j, and then by doing a measurement in the computational basis state, we can figure out the value of j, and thus which one of the original states we must have had. Okay, it's, it's really uh, uh, very simple. That's the process which is used uh, to do the distinguishing. And if you think about it, it's essentially this process which was being used back by Bob in the, in the lab. What he was doing, he had his four orthonormal states, he applied some unitary operation, and then he was able to tell them apart. That's, that's you know, the general structure 
uh, of uh, the proof. Okay, that really wraps up what I want to say uh, in this video. I will add just a little uh, coda. Um, it's too easy not to. Um, it's about a new notion of measurement. So we've been talking about measurement um, in the computational basis. I want to introduce a more general notion of measuring a quantum state in an orthonormal basis. So you know, remember you know, how we describe a measurement in the computational uh, basis. Uh, we imagine that we have a quantum state as a sum over you know, the amplitudes alpha j times the computational basis states. Um, and we do the measurement and we get outcome j uh, with probability given by the amplitude squared and the posterior uh, state after that measurement result is obtained is just the corresponding computational basis state. So what a measurement in an arbitrary uh, 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 orthonormal basis is, so let's say in some basis uh, of orthonormal states psi j, uh, it, this is a new procedure, it's a new primitive which we're imagining and so what we what we do is we imagine that we, because we, it's an orthonormal basis we can expand any state psi uh, in terms of some linear combination of those basis states these will be different coefficients uh, than before, of course, if, if this for a general basis. And then what the, ortho, the measurement in that basis does is it gives us the outcome j with probability alpha j squared and posterior state psi j. So if you actually wanted to do this in practice, a way of doing it would be to take that unitary operation we had before, apply it to the state psi, so it changes all these psi j's into the j states, do the measurement in the computational basis state to get the outcome j with probability alpha j squared, and then um, to apply the inverse unitary operation to get us, which is also unitary, apply that inverse unitary to get us back uh, to the original state psi j. So that would actually be a way of using unitaries and computational basis measurements um, to effectively do uh, this operation. So this measurement in the psi j basis, in other words, can be broken down in terms of familiar uh, primitive operations that we already have. And this notion of measurement in an arbitrary basis, uh, is actually an arbitrary orthonormal basis, is actually a very useful one. Um, you, know, that you can describe, you can sum up the end of the superdense coding protocol as just saying, Bob does a measurement in the Bell basis. And what we're going to see when we look at teleportation is indeed, uh, again, we're doing measurements, in fact, in the same basis, in the Bell basis, uh, again. So that's a nice way of thinking about it. OK, so we'll, we'll revisit this notion again uh, in future videos. Um, that completes uh, this uh, video. Next time, what we're going to do is we're going to take all the little bits and pieces of understanding that we've developed about superdense coding, put it all together and look at the protocol in the large again uh, to see uh, what we've learned and how much simpler the superdense coding protocol looks as a result.